Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Kyler Flock, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at the Matthews Opera House, um, as well as our Big Read Manager. And I just want to welcome everyone uh, back for our uh, third Bellman of the Year and our third and final Bellman um, that is directly tied into our Big Read, our 2021 Big Read programming, um, which is, of course, centered around A Wizard of Diversity by Ursula Le Guin. Um, and today's Bellman is actually going to be directly related to the book uh, to get the protagonist um, and the adventure that he goes on throughout this book and kind of looking at it through the lens of um, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, um, a famous kind of monomyth or archetype um, that he was kind of famous for uh, establishing and and figuring out. And so today is going to be a, a presentation that is going to be centered around his themes and how it relates to um, to Ged's adventure. Uh, I've created a PowerPoint, a uh, quick little presentation that's just going to kind of provide some visuals. Um, and in the meantime, I'm kind of just going to be talking and ranting um, about some of the things that we've kind of found similar and different um, through that. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and create the or show you guys the PowerPoint. So we're going to go ahead and get that going. Okay, A Hero's Journey, Ged's Quest. So as you can see right there, it's a part of our 2021 um, Big Read Spearfish, but as well as in our Bellman Brown Bag series. Okay, so what I what exactly is this? I kind of gave you guys a little intro there at the beginning, but it probably didn't make as much sense as when we actually kind of start the presentation. So um, as it says right here, this will be an in-depth analysis comparing and contrasting the narrative archetype of the hero's journey with Ged's own journey in A Wizard of Ursi. Um, and we're also going to be looking at um, other uh, similarities and differences in some other famous novels that are structured around this hero's journey. There are so many books and movies that um, as we kind of go through this PowerPoint, you're going to start to think of, oh, it's just like that movie or just like this book. Um, the, the hero's journey archetype is one of the most interesting and kind of fascinating, um, I guess, literary criticisms that there are um, out there. Um, for those who don't know, um, uh, this was actually something that I worked on um, at, at, in, in college. Um, I took a literary criticism class with uh, Dr. Martin Fashbaugh. And um, in that class, you just go over all of the different um, different criticisms that there are out there and how to kind of deconstruct uh, literature. And one of the ones that I was always drawn to was this, this hero's journey um, and just how striking it is and all the different similarities that you can find. Um, so a hero's journey, what this is, is it's a common idea or thread of stories that tell of a hero who goes on an adventure, accomplishes a victory and returns home to changed. Another word for that that you'll be hearing me say a lot, which uh, Joseph Campbell actually coined, is a monomyth. Um, so the two kind of big names associated with the hero's journey um, are Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung. Um, they are the first ones to kind of identify this common theme, specifically Joseph Campbell. Uh, the Hero with a Thousand Faces was, um, was a piece of literature that Campbell um, came out with uh, I believe the first edition came out in the 50s, the second edition in like the late 60s, I think. Um, and it does exactly kind of what we're about to do, where he um, talks about all these different myths throughout Eastern and Western culture and just how strikingly similar and archetypal that they are. Um, and it really is fascinating when you start to look at how old some of these texts go back that especially Campbell references um, all the way to present day to some of your favorite movies that, or books that you love, you know, they will follow these same themes. Um, oftentimes they are broken down in either three acts, 12 steps or 17 steps. Uh, Joseph Campbell, um, the original idea or the archetype were 17 steps um, that he had that the hero will go on in their journey. Uh, over time, that kind of got simplified down into 12 steps. And in fact, for this presentation, we're going to just be focusing on the 12 steps. Um, the 12 steps are a little more summed up and a little easier for the average viewer or listener. Um, I do encourage any of you out there who uh, maybe already have a 
good bit of background knowledge on this topic to kind of maybe read through this presentation through the 17 steps that um, Campbell had put forth. At the end, I am going to talk about some of important steps from Campbell's 17 steps that I think are important that might not specifically be in the 12 steps, but um, almost always it ends up in three clean acts. So like for the 12 steps, it's sort of four steps in each act. And these three acts are um, separation, the hero separating from the ordinary world, the initiation, the time that they're in this sort of special world, and then the return, the return to the to the normal world, but the hero is now changed. And so um, that's kind of the way to look at it. I've got a, so here is Joseph Campbell's 17 stages. Uh, as you can see right here, this is based on the hero with a thousand faces, the adventure of a hero. It kind of goes, um, in the backward circle here, um, but here are those three steps I was talking about are those three classes that these break into the separation for the hero, you know, is trying to be convinced to go on this adventure down here in the initiation. This is all of the time the hero is basically on or in the adventure and then the return coming back to home. Um, so you can see these different steps, the call to adventure, the refusal of the call. These are things we're going to be um, getting really into. Um, but yeah, Joseph had these broken into 17 steps. Um, and this is the simplified version, maybe not simplified, but um, a kind of a few of those steps from Campbell's you could maybe kind of combine. But once again, it's the same idea, the ordinary world, the special world. Um, here would be your sort of return here is the separation stage and down here is the initiation um this special world theme is something that we're going to keep kind of getting into but um it, it's this this whole concept is so um you know mental and physical for this hero and uh we're really gonna we're really gonna get into this um but you know kind of going back to why this is even a thing or why this was important to discover for someone like Carl Jung or Joseph Campbell is that, you know, it's just over, over time, it's just this collection of myths um, that have been told from country to country, land to land, and they all have these just similar themes and archetypes. And, you know, it, you begin to question why, and, and I think that's why these two and many others have tried to kind of um, break this down because it's important and it really is, Kind of evolved on how filmmakers writers everyone just tells stories um and we're going to get into how this specifically relates to ged from our book um so before i go any further i should add that you know if you have not finished the book go ahead and hit that pause button because um we're really going to be getting into the weeds of the plot to a wizard of earthsea so if i would hate to uh you know spoil spoil the surprise for anyone who's still working on this book but when you finish the novel, I really encourage you to come back and watch this presentation and kind of see, because, you know, what's even more exciting is you might have different steps um, for Ged's journey, like uh, the call to adventure or over here, the road back, you know, what I think, what I assumed or um, kind of defend as what his road back could be, could be completely different to how you read the book. Um, so that's sort of the fun of archetypes and doing literary criticism. All right. So the first step that every hero always takes is the, um, is the ordinary world. They have to start somewhere, right? Um, it's where the journey always begins. It's where the hero is, you know, usually some form, um, somehow or another, a lesser version of themselves, whether that means they're, you know, living in a mundane life, maybe don't have abilities yet. Um, they're trapped in a society. Um, but more often than not, you know, archetypally speaking, the hero knows that there's something more out there. There's something inside them that they know that they're either destined for something. Um, it's just, you know, something within them. And uh, for the Wizard of Ursi, um, you know, right off the bat, we're told that Ged is destined for more. You know, uh, the book opens up the very first page, I'm just going to kind of skim it real quick here, but um, it just kind of goes on and on about um, this young 
boy who ev- eventually ends up, they even quote him as eventually becomes a dragon lord or archmage. Um, but still, he had to start somewhere, and that was just as a little kid named Dunny. Um, and he was born on the island of Gaunt. Um, you know, when he's born, he doesn't have any abilities yet. Um, his mother dies with him at birth, and he's sort of uh, just this kind of odd child who lives on this island with his father and his brother. Um, and that's kind of where this journey starts. So, yeah, we know that, yeah, eventually Ged is this amazing wizard, but they all have to start somewhere. And and that's what's cool about the hero's journey is it always starts kind of somewhere pretty mundane. Um, and other famous liter- literary example would be Harry Potter. Um, I included this image right here of him with his uh, aunt and uncle um, at the beginning of the book and movie, you know, his life is horrible. He's stuck in this, in the muggles world. He doesn't even know he's a wizard yet. Um, but he has that kind of interesting encounter with a snake at the zoo. And that's sort of your first clue that Harry Potter is destined for something more. Um, and, and, uh, so you can kind of see the, com- the comparisons there. I would say the one difference here with the ordinary world is that even even when Ged or Dunny, as he's named at the time, even when he's born into this world, um, it's certainly not an ordinary world. This whole world of Earthsea is a is a fantasy world. You know, like for a lot of other examples in the hero's journey, they're usually literally living in a boring world and going into a special world. Whereas Earthsea is sort of already a special world in itself. Um, but being born on Gaunt, which is described in the book as sort of a a lesser known island you do sort of see that ordinariness um and uh and so yeah and harry potter though is a pretty prime example of the of the ordinary world all right on to the next step the call to adventure um how is destiny chosen to call upon the hero you know it's a classic question um usually it's something physically that happens to characters or they get a visit. Um, there's something from the other world that dips into their mundane world that sort of gets them interested. Um, this step wasn't as clear cut in uh, wizard of Earthsea. Um, for me personally, and I feel like I could defend this pretty well. I feel like Ged's call to adventure comes pretty quick in his life uh, when he's still a child And there's um, this kind of empire army from a neighboring island, and they're called the Kargs. And they're sort of conquerors, um, pillagers, I guess. would And they're coming over to Gaunt to kind of just take over, expand, expand their empire. And this, you know, this village is nothing but farmers and and, uh, sort of just kind of folks living the simple life. And it is actually Ged who is sort of thrust into adventure by um, already having to use his what little magic he knows to create the famous Gaunt Mist, which then the Kargs get confused, um, don't know where they're at. And that's when um, the people of Gaunt come in and, and actually pull off quite the upset. And, uh, and from that point on, it's sort of Ged has sort of already thrust himself into this magic sphere of he's already sort of a hero so his call to adventure isn't as different uh, or is actually kind of quite different like a prime example of a of a call to adventure is in the hobbit when gandalf knocks on bilbo's door i mean that is straight i mean coming out of left field you know bilbo just gets a knock on the door and boom there's a wizard at his door ask him to go on this crazy quest with these dwarves that's sort of your archetypal classic example. That's the best example I could give you of, of the of the call to action. So Ged isn't necessarily, um, it's, I mean, it is a surprise, but he kind of, he's not so ordinary as Bilbo was when Gandalf first approached, but, but still, you kind of get the idea of this call to adventure. Um, yeah, and almost always, the heroes are left with a choice. And I think that's a really important step to know is that, you know, Ged could have just not performed the magic. Bilbo could have told Gandalf, no, thanks. There's always a choice. And so it kind of goes to show that, that uh, the heroes know their destiny well enough and they clearly make the right decision. Um, So here are a couple images of, 
of kind of what I was just speaking about. There you have Gandalf approaching um, Bilbo about going on an adventure. And here, um, one thing I forgot to add is the fun thing about this presentation is you'll get to see some really cool fan art uh, from characters from Earthsea. So if you've been kind of wondering how to imagine Ged or here's uh, Ogion or Ogion, um, his mentor. Um, but I included these to kind of show a young Ged um, kind of just still figuring out life. All right, so on to the third step, the refusal of the call. So the hero almost always denies at first. Um, it's usually feel, fueled by some sort of emotion, um, which we're going to find that emotion and, um, and that aspect of kind of the internal struggle is just as much a part of this hero's adventure as the external. Um, but yeah, there's always some sort of hesitation from the hero to make the step into the unknown or to the other world. Um, and which is why I think, you know, I added this here, that this step really is so uh, interpersonal um, because it's often sort of already questioning our hero's ego or their fear or what's going on mentally with them. Um, Ged is a little unorthodox to Campbell's classic archetype. Um, so although he accepts this, this kind of thrusting into the new world, um, of taking, taking on the cargs, um, I think his refusal comes a little later on in the book. So to kind of catch you up, after Ged defeats the cargs, people realize that he's probably destined um, for something more. And so his aunt, who had taught him what little magic he knew, um, offers to, uh, they get a visit from Ogion, um, who is just your classic older advanced wizard um, who is going to take Ged sort of as an apprentice. Um, and it's during those initial few weeks where Ged is kind of learning the true test of what a wizard is, is where you see his refusal. Um, what, with his time with Ogion, uh, he's finding Ogion is really slow and methodical, um, puts an emphasis more on kind of learning nature and things around him as opposed to magic. And Ged is starting to get really frustrated because in Ged's mind, you know, by now a wizard, he should be able to know how to, you know, create fire and control weather. And he's not really learning any of that yet. He's just kind of learning the simple life and learning the naming of things and the structure of environment. And to him, he doesn't realize the importance of that yet. And so um, for me, his refusal comes uh, when he is sort of over um, Ogeon's training and is wants wants more from it. Uh, in fact, he even you know kind of starts to become a difficult student with Ogeon, um, gets himself into some trouble with some dark magic when he's trying to impress another girl who lives in the in the area around them. And so I think his refusal of the call is actually here because he's you know it's almost like he's well for one he's denying Ogeon because of his own internal issues, you know, at the beginning, Ged's got a big ego problem. Um, and when he feels like he isn't being challenged enough, um, or is, you know, is questioning his training, he's not really he's kind of seeing the big picture of why any of this is important. And so this is kind of your first time where you're seeing the flaws of Ged. Um, and so yeah, he actually ends up refusing Ojeon and decides to go to the actual wizard school where he thinks he'll actually get challenged more. So although he's denying Ojeon, they still remain close. Ojeon just recommends, hey, maybe you go to this wizard school. And again, in other fantasy novels, this is a little more clear cut. Uh, as we just showed you Bilbo and Gandalf, Bilbo's first, I feel like, few times that Gandalf asks about this quest. Bilbo's pretty adamant that he's not gonna go, but as we all know, you know, his own fear kind of gets in the way. Eventually Bilbo sort of overcomes that fear and then is thrust into the action. Okay. Next step, step four, meeting the mentor. Um, this is often close, um, usually before even the refusal of the call. So it's kind of weird that it's step four, um, but the hero encounters a mentor of some kind um, who's going to offer them advice, uh, be that, you know, be that person for them. Gandalf, you know, is, is your classic example of meeting the mentor. Um, it's someone from this other world with experience, you know, like, uh, like Neo from 
uh, the Matrix has Morpheus as sort of his mentor for a movie reference, or, you know, it's a Jedi Master from Star Wars. It's something like that. Um, also, oftentimes a loving mother, you know, um, that loving mother archetype is something really important um, that I wanted to add to. Um, for Earthsea, you know, it doesn't get any better than um, Ogeon as a mentor. And you really see that in those initial few weeks where he's trying to train get he's way more patient and he's extremely wise you know little things don't affect him um he's just got a really good aspect of the world around him and how to manage that and um forget that's huge it's the first you know experienced wizard he's ever met at first he's a little frustrated because i think he wants to see more from ogion but it's kind of that first person in get's life where he realizes this person's actions actually do speak louder um, than the words. And uh, I think he, you know, without Ogeon, Ged would never even know, A, about the school for wizards on, on Roke Island. Um, and, uh, and he also wouldn't know just sort of about what it takes to be a wizard. Um, and in other fantasy novels, a uh, really good example of this, you know, I mentioned Gandalf, but Jim from The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is another, ex you know, perfect example. He is, he's Huck's guide. He knows the river. He's the older, wiser, mature adult that's sort of leading the action and sort of teaching Huck um, at the same time. So here are uh, two classic pictures. So right here is Ogeon. He's our mentor from a wizard of earth sea that's a perfect image it's sort of exactly how i imagined him is yeah just sort of this older dark complected wizard who you know navigates around the woods and is quiet usually has his hood up um loves kind of just sitting in the rain that's how patient he is and then of course um jim from huckleberry finn guiding guiding on the river all right step five crossing the threshold um, so this is kind of finally where we're seeing that hero go from the ordinary world into the special world. Um, and there's a lot of different ways you can call that special world, but it's, it's just the unknown. It's into the unknown. Um, oftentimes it's an adventure of self-discovery just as much as it is, you know, an external um, discovery. And uh, in our book, A Wizard of Earth C, I think Ged's true crossing of the threshold is finally leaving Ogeon and going to Roke Island, which is uh, where the, the famous school for wizards is at. This is the first time in Ged's life where he's not the only special being um, in his vicinity. He's finally at a school that's full of um, other wizards and other magical beings. And it takes a toll on Ged. You know, his first few moments in the school, his ego is just already constantly um, tested. He doesn't like being the one or you know he doesn't like being just one of many great wizards and it takes him a little while to adjust to that but it's kind of getting thrust into this world um is where we're really seeing ged get used to beginning this journey and and kind of fighting his own personal demons um in other fantasy novels and uh, the wonderful wizard of oz i mean this one's perfect because dorothy's literally swept from the ordinary world into the special world and sort of add even more about that is in the in the movie the wizard of oz they even show you this with color i mean when dorothy is in kansas it's black and white it's boring it's mundane and then through the tornado she's thrust into oz and it's this just explosion of color um from a cinematic standpoint it's the same thing from when you're reading the book or when these heroes are are uh, embarking on it. it's supposed to be that big of a change um into their world and then another good example, of course, is Alice through the looking glass. She's literally falling through the threshold. Um, so it can be very external, like Dorothy and Alice, um, or it can be super internal where maybe that threshold is a state of mind. Um, so that's kind of a fun part about that step is where it shows the, the both internal and external differences. Um, so the top image there is a is a beautifully beautifully done image of the island of Roke where Ged's school is. In the book, it talks about sort of the city stacked upon it, themselves in the school, I believe, somewhere up in there. And then over here on the islands is where they have some other classes. And then here's Dorothy walking through into the colorful world of Oz. 
All right, step six, tests, allies, and enemies. Um, this is so much on par with what Ged um, experiences, especially while in Roke. Um, for, yeah, for me, it's just his time on Roke Island adjusting to life at wizard school. You know, it oftentimes on step six, um, it's the hero learning the rules of the world. You know, like uh, for a movie example, in The Matrix, um, when Neo is learning about being in the matrix is when he starts to learn, you know, how to like jump from building to building or for Luke Skywalker, it's learning the abilities of, you know, having the force and how to be a, a Jedi um, with Harry Potter, you know, it's him adjusting to life at Hogwarts, meeting friends like the allies, like Ron and uh, Hermione or enemies like Draco Malfoy or bigger enemies, you know, that are involved with the deep plot, but it's, yeah, it's just them. Um, starting to be tested and and the true challenges will really start to arise at this point this is sort of we're kind of we're we're at exactly halfway through our 12 steps and so this is sort of when you're at you know back to that image of the circle you know this is at the point where you're at the bottom of the circle you're fully entrenched now into the special world and now you're sort of adjusting to this special world um for Ged uh you know his experiences while at Roke he meets Plenty of tests um, with like school, some of the riddles from his professors or teachers. Um, and of course, the, the first time we see the true antagonist of the story, the shadow. Um, and he also meets allies. Uh, he meets a good friend in Vetch. Um, and of course, some of his other teachers that he gets along with and his pet Otek. And then plenty of enemies, you know, like Jasper and of, of course, the shadow. Jasper reminded me so much of uh, Draco Malfoy with Harry Potter, uh, just because, you know, these are both wizard schools and they're both sort of difficult characters involved and always not so nice to our protagonists, but they're kind of the example of, you know, two people already pretty adjusted to the special world and maybe having their own problem with this outsider coming in or this new outsider. Um, and so, yeah. Um, Ged's ego definitely being tested here while at Roke, which adds to this whole story um, in a very unique way. Um, so here's some pick art of Jasper and Vetch and some of the teachers at Roke. Um, each teacher sort of has their own specialty. You know, one is like the naming professor. Um, one is the keeper at the door. This one's an herbal teacher. Um, so yeah, they each kind of have their own specialties that they teach. And of course, we all know these three famous kids at Hogwarts. All right, so step seven, approach to the innermost cave. Um, it's at this point where our heroes usually faced with whatever their greatest fear is. Um, this is often very metaphorical, the step seven, the innermost cave. Um, you know, it's, it's a fear a lot of times, you know, like forget. It's, it's facing that shadow, which that shadow is not only an external fear, but uh, as we will know later on in the book, you know, it's completely driven by Ged's own issues. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's where the, he it's usually where the hero is faced with their first true test. Um, and uh, in, in this book, I think this approach to the innermost cave comes at the at the tail end of Ged's time at Roke Island. It's him and Jasper when they got into this little quarrel and they were both testing each other's egos and Jasper sort of challenges Ged to test his abilities. So Ged tries bringing back the dead to life because, you know, at this point, Ged's becoming quite the wizard. He's getting really good. Um, in Ged's own mind, he probably can't even be stopped. Um, and so when him and Jasper get into this little fight, he sort of accidentally brings forth this um, shadow. And, and the shadow, which is, of course, the antagonist in this book, is one of the coolest villains in really any literary piece just because of how dark and, and sort of demented they describe the shadow. Ged's not able to defeat it. Um, it, it, it takes the, the headmaster of the school to take the shadow down, but it so difficult that the professor or the head wizard dies dies along with it and it doesn't even fully defeat the shadow and so it's kind of from this point on where ged has almost voluntarily created the plot like you don't see that a lot um in 
in the hero's journey where but it's actually you know ged's own doing that starts this problem but i guess that's also like the fantasy novel that i included to um tie these two steps in it's you know in in the odyssey it's when odysseus's own crew opens the bag of winds that sends them all the way back and basically have to restart their whole journey again so yeah oftentimes this can be kind of the lowest one of the lowest points in the book but yeah this is where ged is for the first time faced with the shadow he does not do very well the shadow kind of kicks his butt along with some of the other teachers and it's the first time where Ged is really broken and, um, yeah, kind of gets whooped and has to essentially take an entire year off to heal back up. Um, but, yeah, he's he's now kind of seeing that there is another top dog in this special world. Um, and so on the left is a really cool old cover of Earthsea. That's Ged on the left taking on the shadow for the first time. And then on the right, you see um, the the gods of the winds shoving Odysseus's crew back. So yeah, two two very tough challenges. All right, step eight: the ordeal or the death. Um, now this is the actual lowest point in the journey. Oftentimes, a part of the hero dies, and once again, this is very metaphorical. This is a part where you know um, either the hero maybe has something physical go wrong. Maybe they lose a hand like Luke Skywalker. Um, Something is hurt, whether it's emotional, maybe they lose a friend, but regardless, this is kind of where the antagonist gets maybe a little bit more success than the hero at this point. Um, You know, uh, forget it's, it's a, it's a bit complicated because his journey is so going back and forth but um i believe this is sort of where after school ends um ged ends up working um for another sort of small uh simple folk island um down in the southeast part of your book in fact i'm gonna check the um lower torning he ends up in lower torning working for these fishermen living the simple life living the good life um eventually has another run-in with the shadow, decides to hop over to the next door island of Pendor, um, which is home to one of the most famous dragons. And Ged thinks if he defeats the dragon, he might be able to figure out more about the shadow. That doesn't go so well. Um, So he goes and tries to face the shadow yet again and loses yet again. It ends up at this uh, island of Ri al And it's at this island where he's sort of been defeated and is resting his wounds. He's found by this um, king and this queen. And it's while on this island or in this castle where I think we see the ordeal or the death. Um, Ged is faced with many examples of death. Um, He's faced with physical death, with um, his pet Otek dying while at this castle. Um, But I think he's also left with emotional death. He feels hopeless because on the one end, he's stuck in this castle with evil beings, but if he leaves this castle, the shadows out there waiting for him. Um, You really kind of see him get really depressed while in this castle because of this. He knows that his energy is being drained. Um, The morale at this castle is not good. There's like I said, an evil King controls it. And there's this stone that is within this castle that they're almost trying to kind of trick get into taking because of his magical abilities. And so, you know, what goes from him thinking these are people trying to kind of help him and build his strength back up when they're really kind of the main or not the main, but they're more antagonists to this plot. And in fact, this evil king and his and his uh, henchmen are the one who kills his pet Otek. Um, he eventually escapes this castle and uh, transforms into a sparrow hawk and flies away. Um, but yeah, he's left with all this death. In fact, the, the queen, the wife of the king, is the one who helps him escape and kind of befriends him. And she even dies um, in this sort of escape plan as well. So um, it's a very, uh, it's at this point in the book where you're getting the most action. It's, it's a really well done chapter, but it is kind of sad that he loses his pet. Um, at this point, he feels like there's no home he can go back to. You know, the fisherman at Low Torn, and he can't go there. He can't go back to the school because 
there's a magic force field around the school that won't let any negative energy in. So he really feels just like, what am I supposed to do right now? Um, and, and he's left with, as this step is called, a true ordeal. You know, what do I do? Um, and he's really questioning his own abilities. He went from this kind of prodigy wizard student um, and through his own kind of foolishness and ego created the shadow that has really made him travel all, all along the world of Earthsea and he still can't find any answers. Um, so yeah, a very hard part in this book um, for, for Ged, but a prime example of Joseph Campbell's Step 8, The Ordeal or Death. Um, another fantasy novel in the, in, the famous, um, in the famous story of Beowulf, this is when he has defeated Grendel and realizes Grendel's mother, the swamp hag, um, he has to defeat her now. And it's sort of this kind of climactic battle. Um, and so I, here are two examples. So on the left here, this is Ged's pet Otek. Um, it's kind of like a cross between a little cat and maybe a weasel or something. It's just a, but this little pet of his was really one of his main um, friends while at school. And he gets really close to this little Otek. And so when you see this Otek die, it actually is pretty sad. And then over there on the right is Beowulf fighting the Swamp Hag. Okay, step nine, the reward. The hero is rewarded something for surviving death. The hero is now a changed person often. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially in a lot of fantasy and adventure, the hero is receives something physical that helps them maybe defeat their enemy. Like in other fantasy novels, I included Harry Potter because he gets the sword of Gryffindor um, in the second book to defeat the Basilisk. Something like that. It um, can oftentimes be physical, like a sword, um, but more often than not, it's usually some sort of knowledge that they learn, uh, which is really cool because if there's anything that you learn in the Wizard of Earthsea is that almost all of Wizard's abilities are based on their knowledge. That's kind of Ursula Le Guin's own little theme that she snuck in there that, you know, in this world and in her concept, knowledge is the real power, which is a great theme to, to base on. You know, it's not about the most dangerous spells or having dragons and weapons, but it's actually learning the, the, the old names of things. And that's how you have power in this, in this world. But um, I think that the gift that Ged receives is from his old mentor, Ogeon, who he runs into again. Um, so as I mentioned in the last slide, after Ged um, finally escapes the evil castle at Re Albai and he's transformed into that Sparrowhawk, he's actually been transformed into a bird for so long that he can't remember how to turn back to a human. And so he, um, ironically enough, flies back to around the Gaunt area. And, it, and it's luckily that he does because uh, Ogeon sees the Sparrowhawk flying around and through his you know, intimate wisdom realizes, hey, I think I, I think I know that bird. And he knows it's Ged and turns Ged back into a human and obviously, you know, rests Ged up. Um, but they have this really kind of special moment when he's healing Ged where he says, you know, he kind of looks at Ged and Ged is explaining to Ogeon that he, he feels defeated. You know, his, his pet is dead. There's nowhere he can go. He can't escape the shadow. The shadow's just always looming around him. Um, of course, you know, making it really a perfect villain. And it's, and it's Ojeon who gives him the gift. And it's really the gift of confidence. You know, he kind of looks at Ged and says, you know, you've defeated dragons. As a kid, you defeated the Kargs. You've escaped this castle. You know, you've graduated from this wizard academy. And he kind of just says, you have all the, the, the tools and the skill set. You just have to apply it. Um, and I think what this does is it really humbles Ged. You know, we see Ged kind of at begin his journey going, you know, just building all this confidence. He's sort of cocky, egotistical, has a big reality check while at school and with the wizard. And then you kind of see him start to decline in his confidence. Well, Ojeon kind of brings it back up and sort of splits the difference between Ged's cocky self and sort of this defeated self and says, you know, use these tools um, and uh, you have to go defeat this shadow. And the problem is, is what Ged's trying to learn is who this shadow is. Because um, in this world, if you can learn your enemy's name, you can have complete control over them. Um, and it's and it's kind of at this point where 
I think Ged is starting to realize what this shadow is. And I, you know, he starts to maybe realize, which spoiler alert, that this shadow might just even be a manifested being of all his negative thoughts. So it might even be an actual part of him. And so now he kind of feels confident and ready to go out on this challenge. Um, I didn't include any images for that one, but which brings us to step 10. And this is kind of where the hero begins their true journey back to normal life. You know, they're at that lowest point. They're down in the kind of the innermost part of the special world. And now they know how they can get out of the special world and return back to kind of home. And, um, you know, for Ged, he now has this clear path of how he can defeat the shadow. Because for Ged, defeating the shadow is that return to the normal life. Um, back in slide one, I kind of talked about that, how, you know, Ged never is thrust into an actual physical other world. The world he lives in, Earthsea, is already a pretty special world. So Ged's kind of return to reality is just getting rid of this looming shadow. And one of my favorite lines in the entire book, and it's a true tra transition point in this novel, is at the very end of chapter seven. I'm going to read it right now. And um, it's the last paragraph. It says, in the cold dawn, when Ojeon woke, Ged was gone. Only he had left in wizardly fashion a message of silver scrawled runes on the hearthstone that faded even as Ojeon read them. Quote, Master, I go hunting. And it's truly where Ged goes from being hunted to the hunter. Um, the shadow has been just following him nonstop. Now he's saying enough is enough. Ojeon is right. I have all the abilities. Um, I am going to come after the shadow. And it's, it's just a perfect line. And it's even more cool because that chapter is called The Hunted and the next chapter is called The Hunting. And it's you're truly seeing a Joseph Campbell archetype be used in a very creative way right here where it's a true transition both metaphorically and physically. And so he now knows that, you know, I'm going to go and defeat the shadow and just get back to life. Um, in some other fantasy novels, we mentioned The Odyssey earlier. Um, it's quite literally Odysseus's return to his wife and family after um, having to go down into the underworld. Um, he's now gone out of that. And he's wanting to just return home to his family. Um, so right here, bottom left, that is a perfect image of, of Ged on his um, boat that he makes called Look Far. Um, and the other one is uh, of... Odysseus and his crew getting attacked by the Cyclops on their return home. But you can see down in that bottom left, the determination in Ged's face. Um, he knows that he's going to battle this sh shadow on the water where I can't hurt anybody else. And yeah, he's kind of just, um, he's at peace with who he is and what he has to do, which is a, a pretty special moment for any hero in their journey. Um, you know, in superhero movies, it's, it's you know, like Spider-Man realizing you know, his true potential as a young hero, you know, it's Luke Skywalker facing Darth Vader. I mean, you can start to see in almost every classic fantasy adventure movie book that there's that point where the hero has everything they need and now they got to just go get it done. Which brings us to step 11, the resurrection hero. This is where life is on the line. The danger is at the peak. This is the, this is the, the final battle often, um, you know, it's it's very climactic at this point. Everything's on the line. And oftentimes there's, you know, there's really only two results. It's, it's you know, stay in the special world or finally return home. And it's up to the hero to kind of make that final decision. Um, for Ged, who now knows the shadow is truly a part of him, he must defeat the shadow in a final battle. And it's in this battle where Ged finally realizes the name of the shadow and it is Ged. It's his own, it truly is his own ego, which is, it just blows my mind how um, genius Ursula was. I just kind of want to go a little bit more in depth of how cool of a concept this is that, you know, through this whole book, we've seen one of the most terrifying and creatively destructive antagonists with the shadow but only to come to find out that it's a true manis manifestation of Ged's own negativeness. And it's funny because when you look back, every time the shadow appears, it's after a flaw of Ged's. So Ged's adventure in the special world, it's almost exactly like his time. Like the shadow is, is the special world um, that he's both having to endure and escape because 
you know, without battling the shadow, Ged can't battle his own inner demons. So you can kind of see how it is, is almost 100% both external and internal, um, which is to me sort of a, a high standard if you're trying to um, create a story through the lens of Joseph Campbell. It's not so easy. Um, and you, it can begin to get almost too archetypal where it's almost too step by step. So I kind of like how Ursula's, as we've found, is not so linear, you know, step one through 12. Like I said, what was it? Step three, um, step five. They're all a little different than, than your classic fantasy novels. Um, but she did this in a very creative way with this final battle. Um, kind of like C.S. Lewis did with the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Aslan defeating the White Witch. That's sort of the most pure example of good versus evil. Um, of course, Aslan winning, the good wins, the children are able to kind of return back home eventually um, in that book. So Resurrection Hero is a very, very important step, and it's sort of where the true decisions are made. Um, and there is Ged and the Shadow facing off for the final time. Uh, that picture is pretty, pretty amazingly accurate to how that whole scene is described at the end of this book, where he reaches out and touches the Shadow and says Ged and defeats it. And with that, Ged becomes, you know, just that much closer to becoming a pretty legendary wizard. Uh, meanwhile, on the other end, um, Aslan facing off with the with the White Witch. But but this idea of the hero battling his own demons or inner issues is is as old as this archetype goes back. Um, and it's a really important lesson too, is that you know oftentimes the biggest battles we face are more internal, anyways. And um, and she just made it even more interesting by creating this, this being. Um, and I'm sure you can think of other examples of, of beings like the shadow. That's actual manifestations of, of our heroes, negative, um, uh, negative opinions or not opinions, but uh, qualities or characteristics, which brings us to the final step, the return to the elixir. Um, I might be saying that wrong, Elixir. It's sort of a tough one, but um, the hero can now use the journey as a part of their life. So it's almost like the return is a prize in itself that heroes kind of use the return from the special world to navigate their every day. Now they have some sort of newness to them, whether it's physical, maybe a new ability or power like a Skywalker or a superhero, or maybe it's more of an internal understanding um, you see that a little bit more in like Alice in Wonderland and Wizard of Earth Sea. Um, yeah. So what, the, what is an elixir or, you know, that this term elixir, it's a treasure. It's a new understanding. So once again, it can be very physical. It can be very spiritual. Um, forget, I think his um, elixir is knowledge. Um, as I mentioned a lot is, you know, is this theme of knowledge is power in the world of Earth Sea, And that's totally true here. I think when you look back in this book, anytime Ged was faced with peril, he escaped through his own kind of good behavior. For example, because I was sort of vague, you know, when he faces the dragon, the dragon makes him an offer. The dragon says, hey, if you tell me your name, I'll help you defeat the dragon. And had Ged done that and kind of fell into his own pride, um, you know, he would have been defeated or when he's on the evil castle at Rial Bai, um, they ask him if he wants that evil stone or that powerful stone. And um, had Ged said yes and kind of fell into his own pride because he knows that that stone would have made him more powerful, but it also would have made him evil. And so, you know, by ignoring his pride and saying no, he escapes death yet again. So you can kind of see through the whole book. In fact, it's fun to go back and reread it. Um, all the times where Ged's own ego is not only what gets him in trouble, but usually what saves him. So now with this new understanding of, hey, I have this ego. Hey, I don't know everything. It's okay to be humble. Things that Ojian represents. Now Ged knows that and can kind of um, use that elixir or treasure into his everyday life. And for me, that's a lot like how Bilbo is. So yeah, he returns home with something physical, right? The ring. Um, which is amazing, great, awesome, powerful. But he also returns home with um, with less fear. You know, with his journey, it's more about learning his own inner courage 
and um, conquering his fears and uh, and how he kind of is now able to navigate life at the Shire with, with no fear because he's faced it all on his journey. Um, and so now we've kind of reached the end of this presentation. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot going on here. Um, and I am not the, the number one expert in the world on Joseph Campbell. In fact, I'm far from it. Um, so, you know, if there are things that I missed, um, you know, throw it in the comments. I, you know, I'd like to hear, and also you maybe tell me a fun example or one of your favorite examples of the hero's journey. I think knowing about these 12 or 17 steps, um, makes, makes, viewing all of those even more fun. It kind of becomes a fun challenge of like finding maybe an unorthodox an, an story or TV show that represents the hero's journey really well. Um, like uh, I know I saw some online of uh, people defending it for movies like Lilo and Stitch or things like that. It really can be that simple. It doesn't have to be all these famous literary examples like Moby Dick or no, it can be Spider-Man, The Matrix, Star Wars, um, all these things I've been referencing. I'm sure you could come up with your own and kind of defend those same 12 steps. Um, but before we ended there, I did want to point out a few things from Joseph Campbell's 17 steps that I thought um, were kind of important to the day or to this presentation. Um, and uh, a couple other little tidbits from the actual book itself that I thought were interesting. Um, before we get into Campbell's few things, I wanted to say a couple other things about Earthsea. Um, I really wanted to highlight a how nonlinear the hero's journey can be like Ged's. It doesn't always fall from step one to 12. They don't always match the plot. Um, like for Ged, you know, steps one through five are really kind of all over the place. Like he meets the mentor, which is step four um, before he has step three, the refusal of the call. So they don't always have to be boom, 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 boom. You know, it can be kind of, um, they can bounce around to an extent, you know, you can't have the, the ordeal or death before the, you know, approach to the innermost cave. Or, so there are times where it has to sort of be linear, but it's not like it's an, a math equation where it must be placed in these certain spots. Um, the next thing is I really wanted to highlight once again, just how specifically important it is that Ged's journey is an internal and external conflict. Um, final one is, um, I wanted to go over these three steps from Joseph Campbell's 17 steps that we didn't talk about. Um, the first one, um, I want to start with, yeah, belly of the whale. Um, and that would be step five of 17 in Joseph Campbell's, um, in his, uh, 17 steps of a hero. And, um, the reason I want to include that, that's the end of the departure. Um, but it's kind of the first initial challenge. So, like I said, this would be step five in the 17 steps. So it's, it's, it's right when the hero has entered the special world and kind of their first initial challenge. And the reason I wanted to include it, um, especially with the name Belly of the Whale, is uh, it reminded me of Ged's um, first encounter with the dragons. Uh, like I said, that was kind of one of those first fights or first, um, I guess, challenges that he really does go on. And yeah, it reminded me of Ged's experience kind of post-graduation from Roke. It's not 100% the archetype, but I wanted to kind of just give that shout out there of, of how even through his 17 steps they follow. Um, the next one, Women as the Temptress. Um, kind of a, a weird one um, that sort of, as time has gone on, you don't see as much. The reason I included it is, is there is always this like person of Temptress, but it's it's interesting that, you know, like historically through text, it's always been the woman as a temptress. And you kind of see this with the Gwyn, um, the same little girl that's on the island at the beginning with Ged, who convinces him to try and do more magic than he's supposed to when he gets in trouble with Ogeon, is the same girl who ends up being the, the queen at Re Albai. Every time that girl is around Ged, she's nothing but exactly that, a temptress. She's trying to tempt him to either take the stone for more magic powers or to, you know, do more abilities than he's supposed to. Um, so she was an, an example of kind of the woman as the temptress, but that's sort of an odd step in the archetype. You know, I don't like it hundred percent. And 
don't understand enough as to why it has to be a woman as a temptress or why can't it just be the figure as a temptress. But I think that gets more into archetypally through history, why it's been a woman as the temptress. So that one, I kind of just want to include because it sort of creates its own conversation in itself. And then the final one is the final step in Campbell's 17 steps, the freedom to live. Um, and in, in, in Campbell's own, he describes this as the hero kind of acclimating back to normal life, um, kind of living the peaceful life. And I added this in there because you don't really get that clear cut of a freedom to live from Ged. He kind of, you know, this is book one of six books. So his journey isn't really over. And that's why earlier on, I kind of defended that for me, his journey is specifically the shadow. I think big picture speaking, he still has um, a lot of adventure left in him. And that's why his special world is a lot different than like Alice's or something, because, you know, like Alice isn't supposed to return to Wonderland or, you know, she's supposed to return back to home and life continues there or Odysseus. He hasn't returned back to the, the journey of the open. So that's why I think Ged's adventure is not him physically leaving, but it was actually the adventure of him taking down the shadow. Um, and that is actually all I have. So I'm going to go ahead and end that and uh, stop sharing, which brings me just back to normal. Um, so I just want to thank everyone again for tuning into this. You know, I hope it all made sense. Like I said, comment if there were things that you wished I would have added or um, or maybe a fun example of, of a hero's journey that, that you'd kind of like to add to, um, to look at. But uh, thanks, everyone. I hope we're all staying safe out there. We only got a few big read events left, so I'm hoping to see everyone. And uh, thank you. Have a good one.